Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, Richard and um, Martin, uh, Georgina, for uh, just the opportunity to be involved at uh, CMCS. Um, I have heard from them that some of you here on our online uh, program today are actually based in Malaysia. And if you are from IAUM with me, then uh, it would be great to be in contact. Uh, so my name is Benjamin. Um, in certain circles, uh, I'm known as Ben Yamin. So feel free to call me which you will. And uh, as mentioned, I literally have just finished, uh, well, I literally just submitted my PhD at the International Islamic University of Malaysia uh, Political Science Department uh, on the very topic that you see on the screen, uh, Christian versus Islamic, Islamic concepts of nation state conflict or confluence. Um, let me just dive right in uh, to my presentation because I do want to just work through, work it through and spend more time on questions and answers if um, if there are any. I will say very quickly that this is my very first time presenting in a CMCS capacity. So I pared down my PowerPoint into something easy to digest, easy to read, easy to understand. Uh, but I'm happy to go in greater depth, uh, you know, verbally, uh, if, if any of you want. I've taken out all academic references because it's in my paper and I'm happy to sub to uh, send everyone a copy of my paper if you want it to full blown uh, works. Um, but um, just before we dive in, let me just uh, take us through what we're doing today. So we are looking today really at the differences and similarities between Western Judeo-Christian versus Islamic concepts of nation state. And obviously the background is that a lot of people see that in tension with each other and in conflict. And we're really looking at um, are there that many conflicts or are there more similarities and confluences than we realize? Um, I think more importantly is whether or not uh, Judeo-Christian and Islamic underlying public theologies are essentially similar or different. And you know, the implications of that is if it is similar, then that gives us a really good foundation to, to work on a shared public theology. If it is diametrically different, then we need to see how that um, binds us and not pulls us apart. So we are hoping, well, I'm hoping today that through the uh, course of this one hour, we get to, um, you get to listen, but also to explore and discuss with me um, your understanding of uh, Christian and Islamic public and political theologies, uh, how that could become the basis for a formation of shared common public moral code on which we could build our diverse and pluralist society, whether Islamic uh, or otherwise. Uh, I have put down here a bit about my background. Uh, so um, as I said, I'm known in, as Benjamin in some circles, Benjamin in, in some other circles. Uh, I do have, I did do my first uh, degree at Cambridge, not at Oxford. And so Oxford has always been a, um, the other place in the UK, uh, but now I, I, I have both. Um, I've also done my MBA at University of London and a business executive education at Harvard, only because I've ended up in a career uh, in business as a business strategy consultant for businesses and governments as well. Um, on the public policy side, I have a master's in public administration from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, uh, an MSc in Asian studies specifically on Southeast Asia and Islam in Southeast Asia uh, from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Strategic Studies in Singapore as well. I do have a master's in Christian studies from the China Graduate School of Theology in Hong Kong, and I've just, uh, I'm finishing up my PhD. Uh, at uh, the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Um, I started life as a political analyst and senior political diplomat with the Singapore Government Foreign Service. I was in charge of China for a period of time, and then I was in charge of Southeast Asia. And then for uh, a specific period of time, I was specifically in charge of Malaysia. So I do know Malaysia a little bit more than, than others, um, I, I, I would say. Um, I have also been appointed into the Hong Kong government uh, public policy advisory board of 12 advisors for a term, and that's four years when I was living in Hong Kong. Uh, I've had the privilege of also being a strategy consultant for the Malaysia government for different of its ministries, and also been advisors for a number of Islamic NGOs in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Um, if you do Google me online, you will also see, I don't say this very much, but I'll say it here, that I've also stood for um, parliamentary elections in Singapore. So I'm also known as, as, um, as a, what's the word, practicing politician, um, although I haven't been elected yet. I stood for three times and I'm not sure if I'm gonna stand again, but it's really changed 
my understanding of public policy and what it means to be involved in public policy and the public square as a person of faith. So let me just dive quickly in. Um, the whole concept of a Western nation state, which most people associate with the Christian concept of Western nation state is actually a lot more historical and a lot more um, theoretical than, than, it, than, it, uh, than, it sound, than it looks. And it really started in 1648 when uh, with the Treaty of Westphalia, the uh, Western world was in you know, bad uh, war, uh, you know, 40 years war at that point, at a point in time, decided to uh, end all the war, establish peace on the basis of a separation of the church and state. And that really was to say, we do not want this world order to be built on confessional basis. In other words, those that believe in Christianity, those that believe in another religion, but we're gonna um, divide it, divide the world up by territorial boundaries and kind of banish uh, religion from the public square. And so the Treaty of Westphalia is also known uh, as the starting date when religion was privatized away from the public square. And as a result of that, there is a very clear theoretical definition of the Westphalian nation state that is really defined by territorial boundaries, not by religious confession. It's a secular state that doesn't allow religion of any sort to come into play in, in, uh, in, in the public square. Uh, it's meant to be, the state is meant to be impartial and, um, and unbiased towards any religion. So the state's meant to be a religious, uh, although it kind of, very quickly steered towards being anti-religious. Um, and that very quickly led to the, 19th, the 20th century to today, where you've got the Western nation state really identified as a secular liberal nation state. And that takes a little bit of unpacking. Um, by the way, I pared down all the academic references and the key um, re researchers uh, that come up with some of these theories. I'm happy to take it offline with any of you who are interested or send you my paper if you want to do specific research into some of these concepts um, uh, that I'm presenting here. Uh, so a lot of this Western Westphalia nation state uh, concept of a secular state is built on religion being banished from the, the public square. In other words, the privatization of religion and secular, secularism equals liberalism. Liberalism basically, as the word liberal means, each to his own faith and belief. You can believe whatever faith you want. You can be a Christian, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Buddhist, you can be whatever you want. Just don't bring it into, into the public square. Keep it in your private life, right? Keep it at your homes behind closed doors. And so the concept was to have a secular, a religious state. And obviously the, that resulted in the state and therefore humans, right, uh, uh, human leaders, placing themselves above religion and God. And what's resulted is public policy that manages religion. So religion is then seen as an aspect of society that needs to be managed through the government, through state policy. And different countries, I'm sure all of you here would have experience of some sort, have different public policies around how religion should be managed in your country, right? Um, either no proselytization, or you need to get a permit to conduct any religious activity, um, or religious grounds and religious land owned by religious bodies needs to be treated in a certain way. And there are a whole load of regulations and rules set by the secular nation state that's meant to manage religion, to keep religion in a box, because it's not meant to interfere or to to infuse itself into public policy and into the state. Right? And as I explain in this way, you can begin to see how much of that is here with us today uh, in, in today's world. So this state and humanism or above religion and God really does tilt the balance in terms of um, you know, our understanding of where faith and, and government, faith and state should really come to play. And I'll talk a bit about that um, later on in this presentation. So liberalism, especially Western liberalism, especially American Western liberalism, has really been equated with concepts of freedom, independence, human rights, autonomy. Freedom meaning I'm free to believe whatever religion I want. I'm free to do whatever I want. And the state and other people cannot and should not restrict me, right? If I want to um, dance down the street naked, I can and you can't stop me. Uh, you can turn your head and look the other way if you, if you think it's an offense 
if it's offensive to you that I'm naked, but you cannot tell me not to, right? Um, independence, again, independence of, of thinking, independence of belief, but also independence of decision-making that I decide, for example, whether I want to pay for healthcare or not. I decide whether I want insurance or I do not want insurance, right? I decide independently if I want to put my mom into an old age home or if I want to look after her uh, myself, whether or not I should get um, state pension or I should not get state pension. So there's a lot of that concepts around autonomy of decision-making. I am me, me, myself, and I, I make my own decisions. Um, human rights around the rights of the individual, the rights of, uh, of a woman or even a 16 year old girl to decide whether or not she's going to keep her um, uh, uh, her baby or go for an, an abortion, right? Uh, and so all of that really plays up into liberalism and secularism as the two pillars of a typical Western Westphalian nation state concept. And you can already see how that becomes really, really difficult in societies and, and states that have a religious background or have some uh, measure of religion uh, in their public life. So what then, what does that then lead to? Um, there are quite a few people in the, and two authors that I will mention are um, Lila, L-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, and Fukuyama, uh, who've written very recently around uh, identity politics, around um, uh, post-liberalism, and a lot of others like them who've done research in this area, interestingly coming from the West itself, have actually said that the entire trajectory of the secular liberal nation state has come to a point where society has become fragmented and atomized. And if you understand and know about the politics of, it, of identity, but I would say I'm woman, I'm female, a, a woman has a certain right, uh, he's black, uh, she's Hispanic, and you start to draw lines and differences based on identity. Not, so I'm not only female, I'm female, I'm lesbian, I'm upper class, I, 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 I vote Trump, and, I, um, and I'm vegetarian, right? And all that defines who I am, right? Or I'm Quaker, or I'm um, Scientology, or I'm Christian, or I'm Islamic. And so society starts to fracture into individuals and communities that define themselves in relation to the other. I am not like you in this way, right? I am distinct from you in this way. And the focus moves away from shared to difference. And the whole politics of difference, politics of identity, which was meant to affirm the individual and the uniqueness of the individual, then turns on its head and, and atomizes society and breaks it up into, into individuals who don't really relate or connect with other individuals. And the result of that really is not just an absence of a shared sense of identity an absence of a shared sense of community, but it's also an absence of a shared moral code or a moral order of values because there is nothing in common anymore, right? I can believe what I want, you can believe what you want and never the twain shall meet. Um, that obviously exists both at the individual level as well as what I would call sub-communities level. So the, the, the blacks living in Harlem, the blacks who are Muslim living in Harlem, right? Or the uh, Pakistanis living in Birmingham, right, uh, who are all educated versus the Bangladeshis living in Birmingham who are not educated, uh, but they're both uh, Muslim, but they go to different places. And so you start to have these distinctiveness that lead to distinction and difference, which actually break apart society rather than pull it together. And that's one of the real challenges that the trajectory of a Western nation state has led us today, which interestingly enough, the West themselves are now saying we need to turn uh, the tide around. One other very important part um, that's come up over the past decades uh, as a challenge to the secular liberal state is also what's called the resurgence of religion. And there are authors uh, that, and researchers who've called it the revenge of God right, um, uh, or the resurgence of religion, meaning religion, religious organizations, religious institutions, as well as individuals saying, no, my religion should not be taken out from the public square. No, I have to bring my religion into how I vote for somebody. No, I want my religion to dictate common law or, or, um, or how the courts decide. And 
all of that resurgence of religion back into the public square really came about after post-World War II, where after two world wars, society, especially in the West, started to realize that really everything was breaking apart rather than holding together. And the result of that, again, is a new call, and this is fairly recent, a new call over um, since the 1980s, 1990s, I would say, maybe even the early 2000s uh, in the West, especially in the US, has started to call for a post-liberal nation state. And a post-liberal nation state, which is very different from post-liberal theology, by the way, that's, that's two totally different concepts. But a post-liberal nation state uh, or post-liberal political, the political uh, theology is really about the fact that liberalism has run its course. Liber liberalism as a political concept has come to a point, or a political theology, has come to a point where it isn't giving answers to hold a community together. It's actually breaking everybody up and society is fragmenting, not just at, this, at the ends, but also at the center. And so um, the post-liberalists in the West are now calling for a shared moral code, saying that there is a place and a role for religion to come back into the public square because uh, religion or religions bring that moral code to society, which is much needed. Um, there is a call for a sense of community, a sense of shared identity, of mutual accountability. And those who, are, who come from a non-religious background would appeal to things like citizenship, right uh for community let's take let's just take canada right so it doesn't matter uh what ethnicity you are we are all canadians and the canadian citizenship is what binds us um uh, so citizenship could be one uh, another one could be um shared city we're all Birm from birmingham we're all Glaswegians, and so that pulls us together regardless of our backgrounds our faith our religion but then there are also those that say that a sense of community shared identity is about the faith like how islamic uh, nation states would say we are all Muslim believers, we are the ummah, uh, the ummah that we come together. And so more and more narratives are coming forward to say, what is it that we share? And again, there's also a call for inclusion and embrace of other religions into the public square and not one religion defining everything in the public square. Let me move on to Islamic nation state concepts. So for Islamic nation states concepts, you really need to think completely outside of the Westphalian concept because it comes from a totally different political tradition. So Islamic nation state concepts come from classical Islamic political theology that really come uh, from the time of Muhammad and Medina and the very first caliphate and how that was structured and how that was handed by word of mouth uh, down traditionally into the various um, uh, caliphates, uh, uh, ca caliphates and caliphal rulers through through, uh, through, the, through the centuries. And in classical Islamic political theology, there is no separation of religion and state. It's one and the same thing, it's two sides of the same coin. There's no such thing as banishing religion from the public square. I mean, that's not even fathomable for Islam because that's just not their mind, that mindset at all. Um, and that the state is under and accountable to God, the state is not above religion. So you can already see from classical Islamic political theology, the differences with a, uh, with a Westphalian um, uh, nation state concept is very stark. Uh, however, there's more to uh, Islamic political theology, which I greatly respect. I think there's a lot there that, that the world can learn, um, is that there is actually a three party structure around state and religion that people in Islamic political theology. So you've got the religious state leader, uh, in some cases, the, the caliph himself. Uh, in other cases, it's, uh, uh, it's a religious leader. Uh, and he is accountable to Allah. He's accountable to God. And I'll come to that a little bit uh, later on as well. But then it's not just him. He is to be advised or to be constrained, and in some cases to be, um, to be displaced by a group of religious leaders that's called the ulama that is learned in the law, understands religion, understands Islamic teaching, and holds the leader uh, and, the, and the government that, he, that uh, the, the leader leads accountable to the, uh, the, the teachings of the, of, uh, of the Quran, uh, and to make sure that the leader is leading in a way that is consistent with the faith and therefore accountable to God. And then for the leader in tandem with the ulama to then lead the people, the ummah, right, the community, uh, that represents that 
that that state right um in traditional classical pol islamic political theology the concept of ummah the community of believers transcends territorial boundaries so there's no such thing as the malaysian ummah versus the uh indonesian ummah versus the ummah in in uh um in glasgow or the ummah in new york because all muslims are part of the same community of believers and they all come into play as one single nation right um again history then overtakes a lot of um, religion and in 1924 there was a collapse of the ottoman empire when the very last uh, um, caliphate uh, put down the caliphate structure and decided to become a democratically elected uh, uh, nation state and take on the westphalian concept of a nation state what that happened was uh, the end of the islamic caliphate and therefore the concept of a single islamic religious ruler but then it gave rise to many many different islamic nation states trying to find different forms of islamic nation states so the middle eastern countries have a very different islamic nation state um, structure from malaysia from indonesia from pakistan uh, from Brunei. And every one of them, including Malaysia, obviously, are trying to find what is the right form of an Islamic nation state that is consistent with Islam and the teachings of, uh, of the Quran, but also relevant and implementable in today's uh, uh, society. And that really is at the heart of the challenge that concepts of Islamic nation states face, right? How can Islamic nation state that was meant to be for the community of Muslim believers embrace the fact that an Islamic state has non-Muslims as its citizens and uh, people of different ethnicities and faiths. And so how can an Islamic nation state feel, uh, the, uh, theology or theory have pluralism and multiculturalism amongst its midst? I have great respect for Malaysia because Malaysia tries very hard to find that balance. And again, in traditional Islam, non-Muslims are not equal to Muslims. Non-Muslims are second uh, class citizens, not in a negative way. There's nothing negative about it because um, the Quran teaches that uh, in Islam, Muslims are to love everyone. But there is difference in thinking even within the Islamic community around whether non-Muslims are equal or not equal to Muslims. And so if you have an Islamic state, for example, Malaysia, and I say Malaysia because my research was on Malaysia, um, do the Islamic institutions, the Islamic laws, the Sharia laws apply only to Muslims or to all Malaysian citizens? And if they apply only to Muslims and the civic law applies to all Malaysian citizens, then do we have a state with two sets of laws with two different types of citizens defined by religion? And what happens if um, you've, got, you've got many other religions of different proportions fighting for attention and fairness of treatment. And it, it starts to get really complicated and Malaysia is only a, a single example. Many other Muslim states, and I'm sure many of you here on this call, on this uh, uh, webinar would, would, can share, struggle to find that balance. So are non-Muslims equal to Muslims or second-class citizens? Do they get same right of treatment? Are they tried in the same courts? Do they, um, do they come under the same common law? or is it another set of laws that apply to them versus Muslims? Is the political leader accountable to God and Allah? Or is he accountable to voters and citizens? Or is he accountable to Allah through the voters and citizens? And what is the role of the Ummah in placing a political leader? If the Ummah are citizens that involve non-Muslims as well. And so within Islamic nation state theology, there are real issues that, um, that are being wrestled with, uh, with no easy answers. And there are solutions across the, 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 uh, the spectrum of Islamic political theology and theory, but there is not as much consensus. And different Islamic nation states today uh, put different uh, of those in practice to various degrees of success. So we now come to something pretty new and, and pretty exciting for me in terms of research, which is the whole concept of post-Islamism. And post-Islamism has got nothing to do with, um, uh, with Islamism uh, as we understand it in terms of, a, of a, an extreme uh, manifestation of Islam. Post-Islamism really is recent Islam, uh, Islamic political theory 
that begins to recognize that the Islamic political concepts, theories, and theology are used to exhaustion. It's not exhausted in the sense that it's not relevant, because it is, but it's used to exhaustion, meaning that there is a lot more thinking and theological construction that needs to be done because the range of, of, of reality is challenging theology in a way that Islam has never been challenged before. And again, that's not just Islam. My next slide is on Christianity. And I think the Christian faith struggles in the same way. And so it's a, a recognition that Islamic political concepts, theories, and theology are being exhausted. Now, I want to be very clear in this call because I've got a lot of um, uh, Islamic friends here. Islam and, and, um, and the Quran is not exhausted. That's not what we're saying. We're saying the political concepts, theories, and theology that derive out of that conceived by man, interpreted by man, those concepts are being exhausted in application. And we're struggling to find new applications of the same fundamental theologies in a new way that would be relevant for us today. So there is a call in post-Islamist Islamism within the Islamic community for new ways to think about and construct Islamic political theology that will be consistent and stay consistent with the Quran and with the teachings of Muhammad and with their understanding of what Islamic, classical Islamic political theology is. Um, there is also a call for Islamic states and governments to embrace the role and the place and the equality of non-believers, pluralism and other faiths. And that is a very controversial issue in theory as well as in practice. So on that count, let me just move on to a big question, which is Westphalian equals Christian. And a lot, again, a lot of the non-Western world assume and equate the Westphalian nation state, the liberal secular nation state as the Judeo-Christian nation state. And I think uh, the Christian community would do well to make a distinction between the two. The Westphalian nation state, even though it came out of the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, in the West, essentially took a position that religion is and should be separated from the state and religion is and should be privatized and not brought into the public square. And for that reason alone, the Westphalian nation state concept is essentially secular, a-religious, non-religious, whichever one of those words you want to use. Whereas a Judeo-Christian political theology maintains that God is above state and just like it's in Islam, that faith and state, faith and world order, faith and government is hand in hand and you cannot separate it. Now, how it can be implemented is a whole different uh, question itself, but the separation, the dichotomy of the two is a false one. And so we wanna take a step back and say, what then is a Christian theology of nation state that we can appeal to? And I would say in my own research that um, just as Islamic political theology is struggling to, uh, to find the concepts that would apply in today's world. I would say in the same way, Christian theology is also struggling to find the right Christian theological concepts and applications in the real world today. Um, but the ones that I feel in my research would be relevant are concepts like man is sinful and therefore so are political leaders and therefore politicals do need accountability to others. And we cannot have a single um, a political leader that is accountable to nobody. All mankind is created by God and therefore equal regardless of faith and background and ethnicity. Mankind was created for community to live with in community with others. And so to affirm community as opposed to the atomization of community is again something that would be consistent in Christian theology. And then we've got Christian relational theology uh, that teaches that God created man to relate and to love and to care and to nurture the other person and not to exploit or harm. And the responsibility of political leaders, states and government therefore to care for everyone, common good. We'll come to the concept in a minute. Right? Also Christian theology of common good, that all creation is created by God for good, for man to prosper. And all creation is created for the enjoyment and use of all man, regardless of background or faith or religion or ethnicity. And that common good is a shared benefit, communal values for good, for the good of all. 
And what's really interesting is as we look at this way of defining Christian concepts of nation state, it is very consistent with what the post-liberalists in the West are now calling for, regardless of their backgrounds. And many of the post-liberalists are, are, who are calling for a, more, a moral order are not themselves believers in any faith. Yet they are seeing the need for a moral order, and they are the ones inviting religion back to the table, right? So the challenges that Christian concepts of nation states face, I think is very similar to the challenges that Islamic concepts of nation states are facing as well. One, what is the role and place of the church or in Islam of, of, of Islam in relation to state and other religions? How can the Christian church or the Christian faith dialogue with and understand and have an understanding of other faiths to find common ground? And how can we build a post-liberal and post-Islamist state for the future and for all with other religions and with those who have no religions? And, and are we able to do that or are we able to co-construct? That's really what I'm saying. Or do we construct our theology in a vacuum and then come out and say, this is the Christian theology of nation state. And if we did that, that invites maybe the Buddhists to then come out with the Buddhist theology of nation state in a vacuum and then come out and say, well, this is my theology of nation state. And then we're gonna end up with competing theologies. And then that, that, that atomization starts all over again. So here's my second last slide. Um, if I did a side-by-side -side comparison of Islamic versus Christian, and I know this is really simplistic, but it helps to frame some of our thinking. In Islam, state and leader is under Allah. In Christianity, state and leader is also under God. In Islam, the state and leader is under religious counsel by the ulama. In Christianity, state and leader should also be under the uh, counsel uh, of religious council uh, of, of the church or the church leaders. The question that both face are in this Islamic state, should it be religious council by the Muslim ulama only or other religious leaders in that same country? And similarly in a Christian, a more Judeo-Christian country where other religions are minorities, is it really just the church of England that, that advises um, the state? How about the other religions in the UK? Where do they stand? And so there are very common issues, as you can see, that both sides are, are, are facing. The state and leader to lead the people for the common benefit of all, the ummah. Similarly, for the Christian uh, um, belief, the state and leader to lead again for the common benefit of all of mankind. Common good is a shared value, uh, a shared good. Common good also in, on the Christian side is also a shared value, a shared good. But the question that both struggle with as well is, is what is the place and role of other religions and non-Muslim believers in an Islamic state? Similarly, what is the place and role of other religions and non-Christian believers in a Judeo-Christian state? And that obviously begs the whole question around uh, the Muslim community in, for example, the UK, or the Muslim community in, for example, um, uh, for example uh, Japan or the Muslim community in Thailand, right? And, and, and what is their role in the public square, if any? Islam, does Islam affirm and embrace pluralism, diversity of beliefs in the public square, in, in political leadership? I'm not answering that because it's a really vexed question, which uh, many Islamic ustas are struggling themselves. Similarly, can Christianity also affirm and embrace pluralism and diversity of beliefs in the public square. Citizenship. Is citizenship in an Islamic state, is citizenship privileges to be defined by religion and faith? So if this is an Islamic state, the Muslims are governed by certain, um, uh, Muslim uh, citizens are governed by certain regulations, and then the non-Muslim citizens are governed by another set of regulations, or are they all the same? In the same way, citizen privileges defined by religion and faith in the UK, for example, or uh, if somebody were um, uh, a Muslim. I mean, I think there was a real breakthrough when London elected its first Muslim mayor, right? And there was a huge outcry in some communities and a huge celebration in others. Um, the place and role of Islamic public institutions, the Sharia courts, the hooded laws, in relation to non-Muslim citizens. Do non-Muslim citizens 
get tried under Sharia law, right? Or do they, or do they go to civic law courts and then the Muslims go to Sharia law courts? What if Sharia laws conflict with common laws? Which one has precedent or are they equal? The place and role of Judeo-Christian public institutions like biblical law, like the judiciary system in relation to non-Christians, how much uh, do Middle Eastern Muslim states take on Western institutional trappings that have been defined by Judeo-Western public uh, um, faith? And is that something that is easily translatable into a majority Muslim uh, setting? So in both cases, we also want to say, what is the role in place of secular atheists? If Islam and Christians, Christianity do not allow, for example, for abortion. Can our public policy allow for secular atheists to decide that they will go for abortion? Is pro-life or anti-life a religious debate or a public policy debate? How much do we impose our religious beliefs as, as, as Muslims, as Christians, onto those who do not have any religious beliefs in public policy in, in a nation state? And those are not easy questions at all. So here is my last slide around, I think, what our shared challenges are across both the Islamic and the Christian communities and, and, and researchers and theologies. One, I think the, shared, the first shared challenge is one of theological thinking and reflection. How can we work hard at mutual listening, mutual understanding, mutual appreciation of other faiths? and what other faiths have to say in terms of their public theologies, their political theologies. And identifying shared visions and shared common purposes. A shared vision, for example, we want our country to be at peace. That's a shared vision, right? A common purpose, we want our country to progress together and to level up so that it's a level playing field for all employees, for example, for all workers to find jobs. Now that's a common purpose. And so can we identify those areas of shared vision and common purpose in public life? And therefore, the second shared challenge, I think, is theological revision construction. So how can we then construct new or revised public and political theologies of our own, of our own faiths in relation to state and religion, governance, politics, society, uh, common good, uh, pluralism, multiculturalism? And how can we, in each of our faiths and together, understand and embrace pluralism, multiculturalism, diversity in mutual coexistence with the other, somebody of, of a different faith from me, without compromising on the theological fundamentals of our own faith, but with more bonds that bind than separate. And the last challenge I would say is, and to me, this is at the very heart because I have been a civil servant for many years. I'm all about praxis. I'm all about app implementation. It's all about where the rubber hits the road. Can we formulate a public policy that's actionable and implementable, implementable and sustainable? So how do we test the constructed theologies that we have through real life implement, implementation, whether through state or through NGOs or through the civic sector? Can our theologies translate into practical, actionable public policies? Or are they just nice theoretical ideas that our public policy counterparts cannot put into action and therefore can never implement. And then I believe that the real challenge is to collaboratively co-construct with each other, with state, religious and civic players to create that common ground for public life. So that's my last slide. And I hope that wasn't too deep a dive uh, again, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible, but I'd be very happy to take questions or discussions, or if anybody here has any research that either adds to or detracts from what I have, I'd be more than happy. This is a work in progress, a thinking in process, a theological construction in process uh, that I want to do in community.